Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first Innovation Masterclass of 2022. Uh, we are on Zoom and we are live on YouTube, and we are delighted that you are able to join us. I hope the first few weeks of 2022 have been good to you. Obviously, those joining us, I think, might have electricity, which is a good thing because we've had some outages. As you know, some trees have been down and had two storms, not just one storm to deal with, but a second one last night as well. So I hope you're all, all staying safe and well and hopefully you are uh, keeping healthy too as the pandemic seems to be waning. Um, my name is Chris Moore, I'm the Head of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Robert Gordon University and along with my team and my colleagues as some of you who you will meet uh, today, Edward Pollock, Sally Charles, Graham Carter, uh, Aisha and Candace. Um, we've been busy, we've been launching a regional uh, startup accelerator with our partners uh, Opportunity Northeast, um, and we had some funding from the Scottish Government and the um, Northeast Economic uh, Recovery and Skills Fund, uh, with funding from SN's SFC as well. Um, so we're delighted to have launched that. We've got some startup teams that you'll be hearing about very soon. We also launched a food and drink entrepreneurship, a tourism entrepreneurship short course, and coming up soon we have a creative entrepreneurship and a female entrepreneurship program to deliver as well. So if you're interested in that go to our website for more information. Um, so it's been an interesting time. I'm delighted that we have a couple of speakers for you uh, and that you're able to join us um, today. So we have uh, Steve McCready, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Lens, um, and I'll do an introduction to him shortly. Um, but before that, um, we have the theme of an entrepreneurship. Um, and I always, I often, um, it's difficult enough to spell entrepreneurship and I often get that one wrong and I've been working in it for enough years. Um, but entrepreneurship often comes up on the spell check as well. But um, we're going to be focusing on that, about how to be an entrepreneur uh, in, over the next, uh, in the course of an hour. Um, and I'm delighted that we're joined today also by uh, Kyle Martin. Now, Kyle is going to be speaking to us about uh, a startup that we have coming out of the university. Um, they joined us for our, our first accelerator program with their technology, which is um, providing attendance tracking solutions. 
Um, and uh, they are entrepreneurs in the university who are looking to launch their product. And um, I'm going to invite Kyle to, I think you're going to share your screen, Kyle. Is that right? You've got a small presentation. I am indeed, Chris. I am indeed. Thank you very much Fantastic. for the introduction. You're welcome. So, Over to you. All right. Thank you all very much. And it really is a great pleasure to be here, folks, and to talk a little bit um, about what we feel has been a very, very successful um, start to a startup, if you see what I did there. No, but in all seriousness, um, I'm delighted to take this opportunity to talk to you a bit about Attender, where we've come from and hopefully where we're going and um, why we think we're going to go there. So Attender is a next generation digital proof of attendance solution. And it really came about as the brainchild of three team members um, from the School of Computing within RGU. Um, so we had Professor Nirmali Waratunga, we had um, one of our research associates, Chamat Paladwana, and we had myself, Dr. Kyle Martin. Um, but we've been tremendously fortunate that although perhaps the initial idea um, was there um, festering in our minds, um, we've been supported wonderfully within the university to bring this to pass. And some of the people who specifically we should highlight are the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group, who very kindly invited us to give us give this talk, as well as within the School of Computing um, and the Academic Administration Group, and of course, IT Services. So I'll talk a little bit about why um, we came up with a tender, and then I'll perhaps hear a little bit of our story and move on to talking about where we are now and where we hope to be. So in short, there's a lot of problems with attendance management currently. Um, one of the big problems we face in the in, within the university in particular is that attendance is typically unverified, so there's no guarantee that um, people are actually here when they say they are signing a paper sheet. Let me just say to all those students in the audience, um, we do know that occasionally you sign in your friends who may not be attending the lecture. Um, it may be camaraderie among colleagues. It is not unknown. But also beyond that, um, paper-based attendance and even many of the early digital solutions are quite inefficient and um, requiring quite a lot of downtime between um, an attendance sheet actually being signed and then um, it's somebody's job to actually digitize all this information. Um, another thing is it's quite inconvenient. It's inconvenient and in the current pandemic, a little bit unsafe to be passing around a paper sheet um, for everybody to handle and sign. And finally, there is some inconsistency where different places, even within RGU, we'd notice different schools would have their own methods for recording attendance. And so we proposed a solution whereby we could record attendance via smartphone. And the way the solution would work is a lecturer would use Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth low energy to basically send a session ID to the student's phone, initiating a digital handshake that would allow the student to mark their attendance for this class. And we worked together with some of the providers for the university um, to, um, to ensure that it went through all the usual university safeguards and could become inclusive of our authentication provider and our timetabling provider. And this really resolved many of the problems um, that could be considered um, within normal um, or traditional attendance mechanisms because it allowed you to verify that people were actually there, it became much more efficient, convenient, and it um, gave a much needed consistency across attendance um, taking. However, we actually didn't start thinking about taking attendance. We didn't just sit down and think to ourselves, right, we want to roll out a new product. What will that product be? Actually, attenders roots are from research into student well-being. And this was an international project that um, we were part of, whereby we were looking into the impact that various factors had on student mental health. And one of the big things that came up fairly frequently was that um, a particularly prominent um, signpost of students starting to have deteriorating mental health was failing to show up to academic events. 
And this grew and grew, and we found that there were a lot more reasons that um, we should be interested in attendance, one of them being regulatory processes. And so we decided we really needed a solution by which we could capture this attendance information because the existing ones weren't good enough, simply put, to support what um, our research in this area. Um, and one of the things we did very, very early on was we applied to the Accelerator um, for when, within the RGU Startup Accelerator Fund. Um, as Chris said, we were part of that, um, their first year cohort, I believe, and we were actually um, the winner of their most innovative award in that first year, something we're very, very proud of. And you can see that I've bolded it to do, just to demonstrate how proud we are. Um, and this did a number of things for Attender and really helped to launch us um, into being much more active about entrepreneurship and focusing internally on how we could build a tender and improve it before ultimately we aim to take it to a wider product. And so one of the things we've done is we've completed a market research study using some of the money we received from that accelerator funding. Um, but perhaps much, much larger, uh, more interesting is we're actually in uh, pilot phase two with the university trialing a tender with staff and students in different schools to test its attendance making capabilities. And this is one of the key advantages, I would say to anybody who is looking at entrepreneurship rather than entrepreneurship, is it really gives you that base of operations whereby you have all these contacts, um, contacts who are very, very willing to work with you. And I can say wholeheartedly, um, there's been nothing short of extremely receptive um, throughout the university in many different departments working together on a tender. So what has this enabled us to do? Well, um, obviously our initial vision for a tender was as an on-campus solution. Plans change, particularly plans made in the last couple of years. And so we've um, expanded it to have a remote marking functionality as well as the on-campus um, marking functionality. And what this has enabled us to do is offer truly hybrid attendance taking in a singular app. Beyond that, as part of the um, as part of the pilot phase, we're running within the university. The university very kindly cooperated with us to help us trial um, two mobile app solutions. Phase one is on the um, screen in front of you, and this um, allowed us to start remote marking um, and try out the trial in various schools. So you can see some screenshots of our app. I won't go through them in detail because I'm very aware I'm an opening app. But the point is we do have two apps that are available on the App Store um, through the support of Robert Gordon University and really giving us access to um, a massive, massive test bed. How big? Well, we've got about, so far, we've got about 150,000 attendance records. Um, that's actually closer to 200,000 now with the recent start of term, um, but we're still collating data from the last couple of weeks. Um, we're talking about over 1,000 sessions. Now, that's a mix of labs, lectures, etc., within the school, and about 4,000 individual people. Again, that number has grown because of the um, recent starts a year. And we're now at the point where we're working with six different schools within the university. And if anybody takes anything away from my talk, one of the things that I would say to anybody looking at this within RGU or within their own university is, do be conscious that sometimes the best test beds really are at your feet. And you really do have the opportunity to examine these things in much, much more detail than you perhaps thought was possible. So, we also enabled us to do um, a survey with many of our responses, giving us some very much needed feedback on the app, how users were finding it. These often directly translated into changes in the app, but more, perhaps more importantly, also gave us an indication of this is where we should be moving forward and gives us a good evidence base for taking to external customers when we're ready to leave the university. And you can see that um, although this is based on an earlier um, survey, we'll be running a new one this term, we're still getting very, very promising responses. So this was just a very, very quick um, introduction to a tender. I am more than happy to take any questions um, in the chat. 
um, as Shama is um, quite waiting to hear from anybody, but hopefully that was a little bit enlightening to you and gave you just an idea of the different opportunities that are available, even though you might not be an entrepreneur, but instead an intrapreneur. And that's me. I'll hand you back to Chris. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Kyle. Thank you ever so much for uh, for illustrating uh, a tender for us. Um, I know you'll you'll probably hang about to take some questions later on. So hopefully we'll get some questions coming through YouTube. So if you have any questions for Kyle, pop them in the chat, put them in the YouTube, and we will certainly get them to him. Um, it, it, it's great what they've done at, at Tender. Um, it really illustrates a story of entrepreneurship across the university, which is something that we encourage very much so. Um, Kyle and his team found a problem. Uh, they, they spoke to um, their, their clients, the lecturers, the students, and they uncovered a problem. Um, and then they created a solution for it. And that solution going through the processes that were done was desirable, people wanted it. It was feasible, technically feasible. Um, it was viable, commercially viable, but it also had that adaptability as well. So certainly when COVID hit, you know, people weren't going into lecture theatres. Uh, and so they had to go back to the drawing board and start to adapt it as well. Um, so, you know, they've done a great job with that and it was great to see, and we encourage that kind of entrepreneurial thinking, that kind of curious thinking, that uncovering of problems and the creation of solutions to those problems uh, and in the organization, uh, in our GU, um, as part of our kind of entrepreneurial mindset as well. So next, uh, I'm going to pass over to our, our keynote speaker. Um, and before I introduce him, uh, there, there were two things. One was that um, I, I, I kind of followed in his footsteps. Uh, last year in July, I had the privilege to give a TED talk in Aberdeen. Hopefully some of you would have seen it. I think it's been seen about a thousand times and I think 990 of those are me watching myself. So there's probably 10 others. You might be the same, Steve, as well. But um, as part of our induction to TED Talks, um, we were asked to watch Steve's TED talk. And if you haven't seen it, it it's fantastic. Sun's in it as well. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you, but if you have the opportunity to go and watch Steve's TED Talk, Steve McCready's TED Talk, then you should do. Um, Steve is the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Lens. Um, I've had the privilege to know Steve for a little while now. And Lens is a social enterprise which provides consultations and training in entrepreneurship for organizations. Um, he's worked in leadership, in organizations, and for charities. As I said, he did a TED Talk, and um, he was a finalist for the uh, Institute of Directors uh, Director of the Year Award in 2015 as well. And Steve's going to share some insights into entrepreneurship alongside some very practical ways. And one of the things that I love about these, these uh, masterclasses is it's very practical. It's things that you can take away with you, learn some lessons once we listen to Steve. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for those, uh, those very kind and, and warm words about, uh, about my TED Talk. Fantastic. So hopefully you got your joining instructions and you managed to bring along a line, a sharp knife and a plate. Now, I know those instructions arrive quite late. So if you don't have one or indeed if you have a lemon, then that's OK. If you don't have a lime or a lemon, then you're going to have to use your imagination. So but hopefully you do. So what I'd like you to do is to take your lime and your knife and be very safe, of course. Please adhere all the health and safety regulations. I don't know where you are or where you're, where you're doing this. So, but I want you to carefully cut the line in half. And then you can cut it in half again so that you have a nice quarter. And just take a moment to smell that wonderful, fantastic, zingy lime fragrance. Um, and what I want you to do now is just put it down, keep it within reach, uh, keep it close by, um, but I'm going to take you on a journey by the power of your imagination. So if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. If you don't, don't. But I want you to picture yourself somewhere else for a moment. I want you to picture yourself on the deck of a sailing ship. And you're about to put out to sea. You're standing on the deck of this large three-masted sailing ship. And there's lots of activity around about the ship as it gets ready to set out on this big, bold voyage. You can feel the wind in your hair and you can smell that salt tang in the air. And you can hear lots of commands, hoist the men, as the captain shouts. And the ropes haul the, the, the sails higher and higher up the mast. And the wind cracks and snaps in the sails. And as the boat begins to heel over, as the wind fills those sails, 
and the ship surges forwards. You can hear the bow wave and you look out over the horizon into the blue sky and you're really excited. You've never been to sea before. This is remarkable. But you're also pretty afraid because you know this is a voyage full of danger and hazard. And at that moment, someone reaches forward and puts something in your hand and you look down to discover that it's a line. And then you realise you're incredibly fortunate because this is a ship carrying lines. And if you feel bold enough, take a taste. Mm. Oh, it's so sharp. It makes you shudder. Now, some people don't like the taste at all. But what if I was to tell you that that was the taste that would save your life? Because this ship carrying lines means that you and your crewmates are not going to suffer from scurvy, a terrible disease that caused huge amounts of unnecessary suffering and could sometimes be fatal. And the knowledge that limes and lemons could prevent scurvy had been known before. In fact, it was known for 45 years. And you might think, well, now I'm pretty annoyed. Why did people know about this for 45 years and not do anything about it? Well, a man called James Lind, who's a Scottish physician based in Edinburgh, had discovered this fact that limes and lemons could prevent scurvy. He knew this was a big problem of the day, so he thought, what am I going to do about this? I'm going to write a book. And he wrote a book called A Treatise on Scurvy that's still available today, believe it or not. And that book ran to 400 pages. But in those 400 pages, only four spoke about this really crucial discovery. So what happened? <coughs> Nothing happened. No one knew about it. No one found out about it. The idea simply didn't spread. But it's even more dramatic than that because the person who actually discovered that limes and lemons could prevent scurvy was Vasco da Gama in 1747. It was to be a full 300 years before that crucial discovery was routinely used in practice. And it just goes to show that ideas, facts, discoveries, innovations, even ones that are really badly needed and badly wanted, sometimes don't get turned into action. So what is it that would help those ideas get turned into action? Well, entrepreneurial skills and entrepreneurial skills are amongst them. We need to be able to tell people about ideas in ways that engage and get people to take action. My name's Steve McCready. I designed and founded The Lens. Uh, and The Lens harnesses creativity, unlocks potential, and it connects leaders in organizations who want to hear ideas with the people with the ideas. And it helps to turn those ideas into action. Now, how do we do that? We do that through developing entrepreneurship. And simply put, that's acting like an entrepreneur inside an organization. So whether you're watching this thinking, I'm an entrepreneur wanting to be in a startup, or I'm likely to work in an organization, then this talk has some key messages about how you can make yourself much more attractive, much more employable, and have a much more successful career. So what are entrepreneurial behaviors? Well, you've heard from Chris earlier on in the, the, the explanation of a tender. Entrepreneurial behavior spots a problem, develops a solution, goes and tests that solution, has an absolutely explicit focus on what the customer, the beneficiary needs and wants, listens to feedback, pivots, adapts, responds, and change. And overwhelmingly, they are persistent, optimistic, and resilient. And these are the behaviors and the skills that leaders want in their organizations. These are the kind of employees that, that, that leaders want. So what do entrepreneurs and what does entrepreneurship actually look like in practice? Well, Gillian and Kenny are two uh, 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 adult support workers who work for Alzheimer's Scotland and they're based in Aviemore, beautiful part of the world. And they worked in a very traditional daycare centre supporting people living with dementia. But they began to experiment using the outdoors and they ran services on uh, using the beautiful scenery around the Rothy Marcus Forest um, and they got fantastic results. Uh, people reported better outcomes, family relationships were better, 
and people living with dementia were less stressed, less anxious, uh, and they were generally much more relaxed. But every time Gillian and Kenny tried to tell people about their idea, then most of their managers said, well, hang on a second, what about what might go wrong? You're using the outdoors, is that safe? Is it all right? What about the weather? What about this? What about that? So their idea stalled. And although they were doing great stuff, it wasn't particularly spreading. So when we went in in the lens to work with Alzheimer's Scotland, this was one of the ideas that was submitted as part of the process. Fantastic idea. And as we began to work with Gillian and Kenny around developing and shaping uh, their idea, ready to pitch for investment, then we said, this is a fantastic opportunity because what they were looking for was a tent, a TP tent to make their provision much more resilient to the weather, much more weatherproof and much more consistent. And we said to them, but this is a remarkable new innovative service delivery model that you could take to other parts of the UK. To which Gillian and Kenny said, didn't you listen? We want a tent. So they were really clear about their ambition being in that locality, in that focused area with uh, the, the people that they were already working with. They couldn't see its bigger potential. However, they successfully got their investment, modest four and a half thousand pounds, they bought this fantastic TP tent, a stove to go in it, and they ran their new service really successfully. And improving it, they developed new partners. And only last year, they announced a £1 million investment in a completely new daycare service for people living with dementia in partnership with the Cairngorms National Park. From four and a half k to £1 million in a service that changes and improves people's lives. Remarkable. And actually, that's the kind of idea that Henry was looking for. I met Henry Simmons, the chief exec of Alzheimer's Scotland, on a really cold, miserable, rainy day in January in a coffee shop in Edinburgh when you could do such things. And Henry said to me, I know we've got remarkable people in our organisation. I know we've got some remarkable talent, but sometimes the ideas just don't manage to find their way up through the fog of the bureaucracy that we've got in our organisation which is really important to keep us safe and steady, but we need to be more imaginative. So he was delighted, not just to find this idea, but to find the talent like Gillian and Kenny and many others. And those were the people who went on to secure other promoted posts within Alzheimer's Scotland. So my question to you is, in every organization we've worked with, and I've worked with 40 or 50, there are, there's every senior leader says that they want people who can behave like this. So how can you develop those skills? And firstly, what ideas might you have to make things better? That could be inside a large organization when you're there. It could be an idea that you have at the moment that could take place within the university. It could be that you've got plans around or are already developing your own startup business. So what are the key skills that will make you highly valued and help you to deliver the impact that you want? Well, there are five things I'm going to tell you about that I guarantee that if you do, you'll be successful. Firstly, how do I tell people about my idea? How might I use business storytelling, for example, to tell people about my idea in a way that persuades them to take action, that helps to secure influence and support? Because unless you build a team around you, you're unlikely to be hugely successful. Two, how do I understand the value that I deliver? And crucially, for whom? And how do you do that? Well, you go and ask people, will this idea make a difference to you? Does that matter to you? And how could I make that better? Three, how can I deliver that value sustainably? So that might be about your business model. Put simply, that means the different building blocks to make it work sustainably. What do I need to do? How much is that going to cost? Who's going to pay for that? And what's the central value at the heart of that, that that needs to be communicated? Four, how do I prototype and test it? In our program, we have a workshop where people actually build on the table a model of their idea. And even if it's an idea or a concept, I would encourage you to do that. Use bits of cardboard, sticky back plastic, 
use Lego, uh, use wee figures of Lego people, do all of that and build it, make it as three dimensional as you can, and then talk to people about your idea. How might you use this? How would you access it? What would it mean to you? What would make it better? A simple low cost prototype is a fantastic idea. Then you can work up your next model. What's the cheapest way in which you can deliver that? And crucially, how do you build that prototype in such a way that you can learn from it and act? And then the fifth and last is how do I secure investment? How do I bring together everything that I've learned through those previous steps into one clear, concise message that gets my point across and invites people to support me? Now, investment could be cash, could be hard cash, but it could also be influence. Will you support me? Will you introduce me to someone else? Will you vouch for me? Or it could be time. Will you allow me some time within my work to be able to do this? So five steps. How do I tell people? How do I tell people about my value? How do I deliver that sustainably? How will I go and test and learn? And how do I get people to support and back me? It took 300 years for the remarkable discovery that limes could prevent a huge amount of unnecessary suffering to be put into practice. I'm certain it won't take you as long to put your ideas into practice, particularly if you use these skills. So these skills will make you more attractive as an employee or as an entrepreneur. They will make you more successful in everything that you attempt to do. And these skills will make you more engaged, more motivated and more satisfied in your job if you're in an organisation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Virtual round of applause. If I can hear it. I can hear it. That's fantastic. Now, there's so many different jump off points there, Steve. Um, and we'll ask anybody. Anybody has any questions for Steve? Please put them in the chat. Uh, if you're using YouTube, you can put it in the, ch in the chat and it will come to me and I can ask Steve. But some, some really interesting points and, and a lot of those will resonate, I think. Uh, you know, the prototyping, certainly, we talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about understanding the customer's need. I guess one of the things, and I guess uh, I'll start with the question, Steve, is about in terms of your experience of working with organizations, mm -hmm. do you get a sense of what kind of leadership cultures um, are the ones that take this on board, that create that space for experimentation, that create the space in the strategy and the budgets, that create some physical safe space for people to go and do this stuff? Do you get a sense for the type of leadership um, that those organizations have? We, we absolutely do, Chris. And in fact, we, we run a workshop now at the beginning of, of our programs, our main organisational change programme. We run a workshop with the executive leadership team, uh, which focuses on the five things that you can do more of and the five things that you can do less of. And that comes from working with 40 or 50 organisations and seeing the behaviours that leaders have demonstrated during those programmes. Um, and even some well-intentioned behaviours can sometimes ca can have some unintended outcomes. So the top three things that people can do is be really clear about purpose or vision. Whatever your organisation, what's the purpose or the vision that we have as an organisation? And how does our strategy really, really can, you know, like crystallise what that is? Secondly, what space do I encourage people to do that takes risks? And how do I support learning? and particularly uh, uh, trying new things. And thirdly, how can I back that practically? How do I put my behaviours into action, or my, my words into action, rather? Um, because we've seen some organisations where people say the right things, but then they don't back that with action. So purpose, learning, and practical steps that allow people room to try new things. No, I think that's really important, Steve. And that, and that brings me on to another point is about this, you know, failure. You know, that's an unavoidable step on the way um, to doing that. And, you know, try new things. Not everything's going to work. Mm -hmm. And so is, is, there, is there anything you want to say about you know, creating that culture where, because I guess most people are judged on the day-to-day -day activity that they have and that their reward mechanisms are usually associated by day-to-day -day performance to meet the KPIs, you know, so it's not about, allowing you to innovate to experiment you know yeah. all that's going to do is get 
going to make me look a fool and people will think, you know, he's done this again and he's, and he's failed and, you know, but my, it's not going to impress my bosses. So how do you reconcile that, that, you know, need, need to try and to fail and to try again and to learn? It's a great question. It's a great point. And it's one that we see time and time again. Um, what I would recommend is if we go back to that point around purpose. So I'll give you an example from Alzheimer Scotland. In the, uh, the investment fund and the investment criteria that we agreed with the leadership team at Alzheimer Scotland, their mission was very clear to help make sure that no one faces dementia alone. So um, any idea, no matter how unusual or how innovative, if it could demonstrate that it helped make sure that no one faced dementia alone was worthy of exploration. So actually, although my idea maybe not work uh, or, or worked in the way that I thought, it's helped me learn how I can move that forward. So provided that my activity is clearly aligned and clearly directed at achieving that purpose and that vision, that might give you room, it does give people room to experiment, to innovate, to change. Because the key question that, I, that, that you highlight is, you know, if every penny's a prisoner, if you know, resources are really tight, how can I afford to take risks? So that failure piece comes from, well, you tried something and you wasted time or money. Actually, if we can evidence that we tried something that helped us to deliver our purpose and our vision better, then actually that is a, a legitimate and worthwhile spend. And we have seen organizations commit to that. So every organization with whom we've worked has put an investment fund on the table that is there to experiment and to innovate. Yeah, and, and you know, something that we've been working a lot of with an, an RGU, you know, one of the reasons that the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group was established was to be seeing as a, as a way of stimulating and fostering not just in entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship mm -hmm. as well. And so the accelerator programs that we've delivered have been aimed at student staff and graduates. Mm -hmm. and those staff, and, you know, are looking at challenges across the university that they can, they can innovate with. And so, you know, a lot of the masterclasses, a lot of the innovation skills classes that we've delivered have been, you know, in-house to try and stimulate that, that culture, if you like, try and foster yeah. that culture yeah. in the organization, um, which, is, which has been great. And, you know, I think the more that can be done in higher education to be able to do that is, is mm -hmm. always welcome. Tell me a little bit about storytelling, because, you know, we had this conversation just before we came, we went live, um, just around, you know, the best ways to create a story. We both worked with Bob and Derek mm -hmm. um, with AB15, and they mentored us when we did our TED Talks. Mm -hmm. The TED Talks are really about storytelling. You you started this by telling a fantastic story um, yeah. and, you know, taking this onto the pirate, onto the ship, sorry, and yeah. getting a sense that. I've just sucked my lime, which is yeah. um, actually not too bad. I feel like I need some tequila, though, to go with it. I must admit. Well, you can use that later. I'll use it later. Tell us a little bit about your you know, storytelling and telling people about the idea. So I guess there's, there, I mean, there are a number of things around the way in which the lens is, is designed, but it's designed to encourage senior leaders to create more of a space that they, where they're willing to listen and that those with the ideas are more able to speak to people about the value of their ideas. So I know that senior leaders want to hear those ideas, but what happens is they get bombarded with a whole range of ideas that are ill-formed, ill-defined, misshapen, and therefore what they do nine times out of 10 is, I'll just ask for more information. So what people hear that is, that's a no. So if we equip entrepreneurs in particular with business storytelling skills, then they're able to get their point across much more quickly to get to the point and to highlight the potential value that their idea has. That's more likely to get support from those senior leaders. And it's one of the key skills that I've used to establish the lens from a standing start in 2015 to, uh, to work with Bob. So Bob Keeler and AB15, the team there has worked with the lens since we started in 2015. Um, uh, and, and, and Bob and Derek have given pro bono time to the lens and supported many, many of our entrepreneurs. So people in organisations who may not have the greatest deal of confidence in public speaking and presenting can get their idea across in a really powerful way using business storytelling. It's an easy to learn, easy to use, highly successful and impactful technique. I think, I think you might have just answered Shola's uh, question. So Shola, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, keep putting your questions in, please. Um, if I have an idea but don't have the skills and knowledge on how to execute such an idea, what's the best thing to do? Get a team. 
get the people who do. So if you've got the idea and you've got the vision and you've got the expertise uh, around what makes that idea powerful and impactful and why it should be done, find somebody else who can help you with the execution. Start from where you are, start to persuade other people. Wouldn't it be better if, what if we tried it this way rather than that? That, that will work. When, when Gillian and Kenny started, they had no idea that they were going to turn their really modest ambition and their real modest idea into a completely brand new £1 million service for people living with dementia in the Abbey Moor and Strathspey area in partnership with Cairngorms National Park. So get people behind you, find the talent that you need. That could be around finance, it could be around execution, around project management, it could be around how to tell people. But if you've got at the heart of your set, your soul knowledge about how to make something better, persuade other people to back you and get on with it. And Samuel asks a related question, actually. How can I find a team that shares my same passion? Talk to them. Go and talk to them. That's the, that's the best thing to do. I can only give you that example. Um, uh, I'll tell you how I persuaded Bob Keeler to join our team. Um, I met with him and I used storytelling and I gave him a spanner. So Bob Keeler is an engineer um, and I gave him a spanner with my business card tied to it. And I said, here's what I'm about to do. I'm setting up this completely new uh, um, uh, business, this new organization, and we're looking for boundary spanners people who connect across organizations and who do really practical things. Uh, and I'd love your support. And he said, I'm in, consider me part of your team. What do you want me to do? So talk to people, your passion will communicate it. And if your idea has the value that you think it has, I guarantee you that people will support you. Cynthia asks, um, do you want to put us, um, I guess entrepreneurs, uh, have to learn kind of speaking skills. I guess you means kind of presentation skills mm. to support and push their ideas. Um, yes, uh, yes and no. Uh, so we've supported hundreds of entrepreneurs uh, to secure two million pounds worth of investment in ideas that no one was listening to, ideas that they cared about, that they were passionate about, but no one listened. So why did they not listen? Well, because people are really busy. Uh, because people are really busy with the day to day. And sometimes entrepreneurs are not that clear about the potential value that their idea has to communicate. So what you don't need to do, and I'm always really reluctant to say what you don't need. I'd rather, tell, I'd rather advise you what I think you could do. But what you don't need to do is to become a really slick public speaking presenter. You don't need a highly polished slide deck you don't need highly polished graphics. You need to have a way to get your message across in two or three minutes that persuades somebody to say, do you know what? That sounds like a good idea. Why don't we do something more with that? That's all you need as an entrepreneur in the early stages. So yes, I would say you need to be able to get your idea across in a way that persuades people to give you support, but that doesn't mean that you need to be a highly polished public speaker or presenter. And in fact, I could point you to many, many of the entrepreneurs that we've worked with who have said, who, who've regularly been frontline staff, who've never spoken in public before, and we've supported them to stand on a stage in front of 200 people and pitch live for investment. And if you want to see some of those in action, if you go, if you go to onto Vimeo and you search for the lens on Vimeo, you'll see all of those presentations actually, and you'll see people using storytelling in real life. And these are not polished presenters. They are fantastic, fantastic presenters, but they are not highly polished public speakers. I, th I think that's a really good point you make there actually, um, Steve, when you said about, I think you said that, you know, people are busy, you yeah. know, and, and, and people, you know, often think that they've, they've got the best idea ever, you know, ever, and everyone's going to listen to you. You know, people aren't waiting around in the university, no one's sitting there waiting for Chris Moore to come up with the next great idea. You know, people are busy, people are doing their own stuff and have their own stuff going on. Yeah. And so we often talk about, and something that I read recently actually, and, and it might be for, for, you know, some advice for people that are maybe leaving the university and going into a large organization for the first mm -hmm. time. Don't go in there all guns blazing. You know, don't go in there with a big project, you know, you're gonna change the organization, gonna change the world, this innovation is, you know, gonna be the best thing that you've ever, because actually people aren't waiting for you to come in and, and do that, you know, so it's kind of a little bit more subtle, I guess, you know, get those early innovators on your side, do the storytelling, 
get yeah. some, you know, get some quick wins, maybe celebrate mm -hmm. those wins. Um, I've got another question. This is from Gabrielle. Uh, we're talking to people. Oh, hold on. We're talking to people. So prospective team members mm -hmm. not expose me to the risk of idea theft. <laughs> um, no, I don't think it will. I guess it depends what you want to do with your idea. Um, we all have to share our ideas at some point. We all have to build a team, I would argue. So if it's an idea that you genuinely think has significant commercial benefit and you want to take it into the wide world as a startup entrepreneur, then that's exactly what you should do. But you're still going to need a team to help support you to deliver that, I would suggest. Um, and if it's in a, an idea, and, and bear in mind that, that the organisations with whom we've worked are primarily purpose-driven organisations. They're primarily about ideas that are improving people's lives. So, so we've seen very little of that, of that issue. What we do see is people a bit afraid around, well, what if I open up my idea? What if I get, what if people don't like it? Or what if people don't think it's very good? What if people don't think I'm very good? That's a much more common problem. If you've got something that's genuinely really valuable and you think it's of commercial value, then build a team, get investment, get out there and, and go do it. Um, but actually it's around how confident am I that my idea can stand the, the scrutiny of, of other people and how can I build permission with other people that allows me to get some constructive criticism to help to improve it. That would be, I suggest, is the, the, the key thing there. And again, I think that's great advice. I think, you know, there will always be the naysayers. Yeah. There will always be, you know, in every organized, large organization, there will be the naysayers and there'll be the people that, you know, just won't have time for it. And I guess you often, when you're trying to be creative, be innovative, you will spend too much mental bandwidth on the naysayers when actually what you need to be focusing on is the people that are supporting you and, and are helping you. You know, it's like when the, when the school report comes home and it's all A's and you've got a D and you just focus on the D. You know, rather than focusing on all yeah. the A's, you know, so where you kind of spend your time, time focusing there. Any and, other? And, and think about the way in which I introduce those five skills. So in our program, we introduce business storytelling first. So we don't critique people's idea at that point. As long as it's aligned, bear in mind, it's already been through a process to align it with purpose. So we know that's an idea that's going to help make sure that no one faces dementia alone in the Alzheimer's Scotland example. So in business storytelling, we don't critique the idea. We just give people a way to tell people about it. But in the next workshop, then we get really crunchy. Then we really begin to focus in on who, for whom does your idea deliver value and how do you know? Or how, more importantly, are you going to go and find out? So it gets pretty gnarly, but you start with that you know, really positive, solution-focused, constructive criticism initially. Yeah. Yeah, great question here from Adam, which I think is really pertinent just now um, What with everything that's going on. Do you think at this time ideas affecting climate change should have a separate avenue of getting noticed? And I guess for climate change, you know, any kind of you know, societal issue, should yeah. there be avenues which they you know, maybe take priority or, or have a way of getting noticed in large organisations? It's a great question. It's a great question. I, I, and I simply don't know. I think, you know, clearly we've all got a huge, huge investment in making, you know, climate change, uh, our, our resolve in climate change and finding ideas that do that. There are a number of different funding streams. I guess the key question in any organisation, whether their purpose and their vision is about climate change, reducing poverty, generating profit for shareholders, whatever their purpose is, then actually having a really clear line of sight around how ideas that deliver on that purpose can get investment. I think that's the key thing. So I would broaden it out across climate change to those other things. Clearly climate change is, is, is a massively important and separate topic that has a number of channels at the moment. The key thing is that is that connectivity between what purpose, what value does my idea deliver and how can I get that message, the potential value of that into the hands of the decision makers who can back me. Great answer, Steve. Any other questions? This last kind of five minutes, if anyone's got any questions, fire them in. I guess what might be quite useful, Steve, is, is just for, for, you know, you've given you five kind of steps, but there will be um, maybe um, graduates or, or students that are going to work in, in kind of, you know, large organizations. Hmm. What's the kind of 
best thing for them to do, do you think, early early on, you know, in the first few weeks, in the first month, maybe, if they, you know, have an innovative mindset, if they can see mm-hmm. some things that, you know, they'd like to, to talk to somebody about, what, what, what would you say? You know, they- I, I think establish some of your own credibility, I think is key. So, so, so get in, get your own credibility established and then begin to look around. And, and, and I would encourage you to, some, to, to focus on what value might my idea deliver. The closer your idea is aligned to the purpose of that organisation, the harder it is for somebody to say no. Right? And, and the reality is that most people want to say yes. Um, they're simply so too, too busy. Um, uh, and therefore, they 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 will they will, you know, they will say. I don't know if people remember, you know, if, if I don't know whether this cuts across in terms of this audience. But if you're a kid or if you're a if you're a parent, then when people keep asking you for something, if you're a child who keeps asking for something, quite often you'll hear a parent say, "We'll see," and what "we'll see" means is no, but it's a it, but it's a more kind of palatable way of saying it. And sometimes middle managers can can do that. So. That's much harder to say if you can present your idea succinctly, concisely, and that it's aligned with the purpose of the organization for whom you work. And that you can say, here's a measurable way we could try something that might make things better and might help us to achieve our mission more successfully. And don't give up hope. That would be the other thing I would say. Even if you get kind of a bit a bit bashed around by the bureaucracy of the organisation, find like-minded people uh, and don't give up hope. Fantastic, thanks, Dave. I think oh no, there's there's another one here from Rachel, uh, who I think is uh, doing a journalism course. In terms of a small family organisation, how do you mm-hmm. take the ideas in when the culture is so close to them? Oh, good question. When the culture is so close to them because they're family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's another great question. It's it, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Understand what's important to them. What is, if that's a family organisation, then then clearly they've got a, a sense of what the purpose of that organisation is, what its values are. We haven't touched on values, and that's a really other important thing here. So in many organisations with, with whom we worked, their value statements are around being bold, uh, being imaginative. Um, so what are the values that that family holds and clearly holds dearly as a family in relation to the organisation, to the business? What do they believe its purpose is and how might my idea align with that? So that even if it's a radically different way of doing it, and, you, and, and, and every one of the ideas that we found challenged the status quo, right? So that means some things are quite unwelcome. Um, but if it challenges the status quo. And if I can demonstrate that it's lined up with that purpose and that vision, and it's going to make us a more sustainable business and organization and deliver better for our customers, that's much easier to have your ideas listened to. And ultimately, if your ideas are not listened to in that organization and entrepreneurship is important to you, go somewhere where it is valued. Because I can promise you that most good employers will want to hear those ideas. And if they don't, that tells you something about how they, 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 look at you and as part of their workforce thanks Steve. well i think that's uh, a wrap folks um that's been truly inspiring it kind of reaffirms everything that i believe and everything that we're trying to do in uh in rgu i think we're getting there you know there's still a lot of work to do but i think we are getting there and so um before i, I say thank you to steve um go and watch his ted talk it's called uh, entrepreneurship more than a spelling mistake um, I'm very jealous of him because he's got 13,721 <laughs> views, which I think 13,700 might be himself. <laughs> but there's a lot more than me, so I've got some way to go to uh, to catch him up. Um, but it's a great it's a great talk, very inspiring, and uh, I won't spoil it. But his uh, his family members in it as well. Um, yeah. We watched it a few times. So listen, someone, been- someone, asked, someone asked someone asked me recently, Chris, was that actually your son? I said, well, who do you think it was? <laughs> of course it was my son. Yeah. Brilliant. Now go go and watch it. It's 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 a great it was in Glasgow, it was TEDx Glasgow, wasn't yeah, it? How long yeah. ago was that? Theatre Royal, 2016. We we were only a year and a half into uh, in, into the lens at that point, so relatively early in our in our journey. Um, but yeah, Theatre Royal Glasgow, eleven hundred people in the audience. It was fantastic, it was great, love lovely event. 
well worth, well worth the watch, folks, if you get the opportunity. Thank so you. all it remains for me to do is to thank Steve. Big virtual round of applause you. for Steve. Thank you. Really, really inspiring. Really appreciate it. We've got some nice uh, comments coming up on the chat. Great. Uh, thank you to Kyle as well for uh, presenting Attenda. Really appreciated that, Kyle. Thanks to the team, obviously, for always doing such a great job, particularly Ed Pollock for you know, making the technology work, getting us on YouTube and everything. Um, just a reminder about the next one. So our next masterclass is on Monday, the 22nd of February, and that's with Lucinda Bryce Gardine from Genius Foods. And then a real treat, particularly for Ed, who's a bit of a Lego fan. Um, we've got uh, Morgan Walker, who is the design director from Lego. Uh, on Mon Monday, the 14th of March. So that's one for your diaries. Monday, the 14th of March, the design director from Lego, hopefully we'll get some freebies in the post, um, is going to be talking to us, Morgan Walker from, from Lego on the 14th of March. That's it from me, folks. Let's hope that um, the, the wind stays off. Let's hope we have some, uh, some quieter days um, and we get back to normal. Thanks once again to Steve for joining us uh, and to Kyle from Attenda. Thanks to you for giving us an hour of your time. And uh, I hope that you um, have a pleasant evening. See you next time. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.